Get ready to explore the icy moons of Jupiter with the European Space Agency's upcoming JUICE mission. Find out more in today's episode. Three, two, one, engine full power. Welcome to Your Space Journey, where we venture into the future of space exploration. Your journey begins now. Hello and welcome to Your Space Journey. I'm your host, Chuck Fields. Today we're going to dive into ESA's upcoming mission to Jupiter called JUICE with operational scientist Clara Vala. ESA's Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, or JUICE, is a mission to study Jupiter and its three largest moons, Ganymede, Europa, and Callisto. Launching in April 2023, JUICE will spend more than three and a half years studying the atmosphere, magnetic field, and magnetosphere of Jupiter, as well as the icy surface and subsurface ocean of the three moons. The spacecraft will be equipped with a suite of scientific instruments, including cameras, spectrometers, and a radar to study the geology, chemistry, and potential habitability of the moons. JUICE will also be the first spacecraft to make in-depth observations of Ganymede, which is the largest moon in our solar system and the only moon known to have a magnetic field. The mission will provide new insights into the formation and evolution of Jupiter and its moons and will help answer key questions about the potential for life beyond Earth. Your space journey. Claire, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> well, it's exciting to have you here, and we're really excited about the upcoming JUICE mission. Uh, for our audience out there that may not know what it is, can you give us just a general overview of what the JUICE mission is and its objectives? Yes, sure. Well, JUICE is a very, very ambitious and very exciting mission uh, that is led by the European Space Agency. And that will be launched uh, in a few uh, few months from now, in April. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, the the mission will actually go and rendezvous with uh, Jupiter and uh, study the, the Jovian environment for a few years. So it's an extremely challenging mission and uh, with a lot of challenges ahead, but extremely exciting. That is exciting. And what is your role with the mission, Claire? Well, my role, uh, I'm an operations scientist. So I'm working at the European Space Agency uh, in Madrid, close to Madrid in Spain, nice. in the European Space Astronomy Center. Wow. And my role is actually to coordinate the uh, the science planning. So basically to organize the strategic uh, operations plan for the instruments once we will be there. Oh, that's that's incredible. If I may ask, our program is called Your Space Journey. So we, we love to just talk about how your sh- space journey began. I was wondering, was there anything in particular that kind of drove, drove your passion for coming into a career in space exploration that you can share? Yes, yes, yes. Well, first, I mean, the topic itself uh, is uh, is extremely exciting. I mean, this is really a humankind kind of uh, quest, I would say. Um, so I was uh, I was basically doing my uh, my university studies uh, in physics, in um, general physics, and I got the very good opportunity while I was uh, in uh, at the university to do an internship at uh, at ESA uh, at S. Tech, so in the Netherlands, uh, where I got um, familiar with the Rosetta mission. And this was just completely fascinating to me because it was really a cornerstone mission also from, from the European Space Agency. So I came back and completed my study and decided to do a PhD in plasma physics to get a bit more involved into uh, into space missions. And uh, I've been working for three, four years on the cluster mission, which is a mission that is studying the magnetospheric environment of the Earth. Uh, and I did then a, a fellowship uh, back again at STEC in the Netherlands. And this is where I really got, uh, got uh, let's say, enrolled in the, in the Rosetta mission. I stayed there for a few years, and then I got this great opportunity to move on to Juice, which is uh, which is absolutely amazing to me. Oh, it is. And that's incredible background, Claire. And I thank you for sharing it with us. Let's talk about this exciting Juice mission. Now, um, how would you say this – I mean, I know how it is, but how would you say Juice differs from some of the previous missions to Jupiter and its moons? Well, there, there were there were several, let's say, flyby uh, within the jo- the Jovian system, but it was more, let's say, an opportunity observations um, from those those missions. The first real mission that took place uh, in the Jovian environment was the Galileo mission, the NASA Galileo mission, back in the nineties, 
And uh, this was an, more of uh, an exploration mission, just to try to understand what was happening there. But it was really, let's say, the, the first step towards a better understanding of the details. And this is what JUICE is all about, to study not only the... Um, uh, the, the, the Jupiter uh, planet uh, on its own, but really the entire uh, Jovian environment, and especially, which is the, let's say, the highest priority for, for the JUICE mission, to study in depth the uh, the three icy moons of Jupiter that are Callisto, Europa, and more than anything, Ganymede. See, and I love that. And the, I, I still remember the first time I saw, I think I went to the museum as a kid, and I saw the pictures from Voyager of Ganymede, uh, Europa and Callisto and think, oh my gosh, this is beautiful. And so I know you mentioned the Galileo mission. Uh, technology has obviously changed a lot since then, even though it wasn't that long ago. But can you tell, can you explain some of the technology used on the Juice spacecraft and how it'll enable scientists to study its moons in more detail? Well, so I can maybe uh, speak, focus more on the instrumentation part because mm -hmm. this is where really we, we are using uh, 21st century technology now. Um, the the main let's say the the, the main um, objective of of uh, the uh, the, um, the the strategy for observing the icy moons is to be able to uh, characterize the 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 interior of those moons and especially uh, the ocean that uh, for which we have strong evidence that they exist underneath the icy crust of of those three moons and for this. Uh, we are using several complementary uh, instrumentation. So we will be orbiting around those moons. So we will not land on those moons, or at least uh, uh, this is not planned. Uh, but we will detect remotely and characterize remotely those, those environments. So, for instance, something that is uh, that is new, at least for the for this kind of observation, is the use of a, a radar, a penetrator, uh, ice penetrator radar that will be able to sound down to uh, up to nine kilometers depth the uh, icy crust of of the moons. So that's that's one of of the of the instrument. But of course, this is complementary with other instrumentation like the magnetic field, which is well the magnetometers that are a key instrument in space science as you as you probably know which is which will allow us to detect and characterize the subsurface ocean so its depth uh, its um, its conductivity uh, and basically um, everything that we we want to know about the interior there are many things I could go on forever because we have 10 instruments that are uh, completely complementary and that should address all the main science objective of the mission which is to understand uh, what are the conditions uh, for the emergence of life and whether we have those conditions of habitability on the, on those three moons. Oh, that's going to be incredible. And Claire, one thing that I was really impressed with is just the, the orbital, orbital trajectory. It's going to do several flybys of the Earth-Moon system, um, I think Venus. And I was just wondering, can you explain a little bit more about that, but really just how long the mission is expected to last and how long it would take mm -hmm. to finally get to Jupiter and do the study? Yes, sure, sure. So as I was saying, the JUICE will launch. So JUICE, um, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned that, but JUICE stands for Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer. So that's the uh, weird acronyms, but this is the one we have. I like it. <laughs> uh, so JUICE will launch in uh, in April this year. And indeed, due to the, the fact that we have a, a heavy spacecraft and we uh, we have a, a limited, let's say, uh, capacity as a launcher uh, with IN5, we will use the, the flyby of some of the uh, of the planet of the um, inner solar system. So basically the Earth, we will also use uh, lunar gravity assist and, and also a flyby of Venus indeed to be able to join uh, Jupiter where we will arrive in eight years from now. So this is a long journey. This is a long distance and this is a very complex trajectory, but this will take us eight years to arrive there. And once we will be there, we will use basically the, 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 the Galilean moons, so Ganymede, uh, Europa and Callisto, to modify the trajectory and to be able to investigate and to visit different portions of the Jovian system. So um, there will be there will be many, many flybys. We plan to have 35 flybys of, of those uh, icy moons, yes, to be able to 
to tweak the trajectory. And we will end with uh, a second part of the mission, which is uh, the more, let's say, uh, in incredible part of it is that we will put um, juice in orbit around Ganymede. So we will leave the, uh, the, the, the gravitational uh, field of, well, not, we will not leave, but we will go from the um, Jup uh, Jupiter orbit into a Ganymede orbit, where we will stay for an additional nine months. See, that's what fascinates me too. And and I, I was just wondering, you know, why, why is there so much focus on Ganymede in, in, from a scientific perspective? Well, so Ganymede is is uh, is extremely fascinating for several reasons. So first of all, well, this is the the largest moon of the solar system, and this is even larger actually than uh, the planet Mercury. So this is uh, this is a very large object, and this is also the only moon we are aware of that have its uh, its intrinsic magnetic field. So it generates its own magnetic field. And this, this magnetic field generated by, by Ganymede is embedded in the much larger and very strong magnetic field of, Ju uh, of Jupiter. And all those interactions that are taking place in this, uh, in this plasma and magnetic environment are actually key to understand uh, larger key processes uh, that are taking place uh, in the solar system and even elsewhere in other uh, stellar system. There is also the, the key point that I mentioned briefly before is the fact that uh, uh, Ganymede, um, such as uh, Europa and Callisto, have strong evidence for an, um, an um, underneath uh, icy crust uh, subsurface uh, ocean. And this subsurface ocean is one of the key elements, uh, the, the, the existence of a liquid water is one of the key elements to search for habitability. So we want to go there, we want to characterize exactly what's going on underneath the surface, and we also want to understand all the processes that are taking place from plasma and magnetospheric environment. See, I find that very interesting, and I, I guess I didn't know, I, I, I knew there was a subsurface ocean on Europa, I didn't realize that possibility of Ganymede and Callisto as well. Um, and I, I guess what also fascinates me too is you're, you're studying the subsurface ocean from from orbit or from flybys. And I, I hate to sound kind of naive, but how do you how do you do that with a spacecraft? Like how will general, what, what can you, how can you study what's underneath the ocean? Um, what would you expect to get from the research in that? So, well, there's, there's many ways. So the first the first way we uh, we do to characterize what's happening underneath the surface uh, is uh, the, the the measurement of uh, the, the magnetic field. So if you have, uh, as I was saying, uh, Ganymede is embedded within uh, the Jovian magnet magnetic field, which is uh, uh, varying uh, over one rotation uh, of, of the planet. And this uh, generates, uh, this can generate uh, uh, induced magnetic fields uh, that are due to the circulating uh, conductive uh, um, uh, layer underneath the surface, which is the liquid ocean. And the measurement of this induced magnetic field will give us uh, some boundary constraint regarding the conductivity of the layer that, in, that is underneath, so the, the the conductivity of the subsurface ocean, and also its its extent. So that's that's one way. The second uh, very important way is to measure the effects of the tides on the planet, uh, on the I'm sorry, on the moon. Mm -hmm. So if you if you if you measure the deformation. Of of the body. So using several techniques, so you can use the measurement of the gravity field. This is done by what we call the radio science instrumentation. So radio science instrumentation is basically using the signal that the spacecraft is sending to Earth to understand uh, what, what are the forces that are exerted on the, 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 the spacecraft. And by doing that, you can get information about the gravity. And if you, and if you see the variation of this gravity, you can deduce uh, information regarding the deformation of the body, the creation of uh, gra um, gravity bulge, for instance. And this can, be, can give you an information regarding whether or not there is a liquid layer in between the icy crust and the, uh, the, the deep interior of the moon. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. And yeah. Claire, if I may ask too, what excites you personally the most about this mission? Well, I, th I think the most exciting point for me is to understand if we can 
eventually find conditions elsewhere than on Earth where life could develop. So that's that's basically the question of hum- that is interesting not only for scientists but really for for the humanity. I mean, this is yeah. something we've been looking at for so long. Um, we are not there yet in the sense that with juice we will not go there and detect life. We are not going there for that. We are just first, uh, the first, let's say, very important step is to check whether we have the conditions that would uh, be uh, necessary for the life to develop. But this is, this is uh, the, the, yes, the, the, the a uh, human can question. So that's, that's definitely what interests, uh, what is the most interested to me. Oh, I, I think that, yeah, that, that would be like the biggest impl- implication ever. I mean, Wow, life elsewhere in the in the universe, especially in our yeah. solar system, would be just incredible. On that, you mentioned yeah. basically, you know, launch coming up here in April. Uh, what are the next steps leading to the Deuce mission? And um, uh, I guess be, besides launch, um, I think you mentioned this before, but I'm asking again. Like, when do we, as it flies by, I guess some of the systems are we going to see results from it flying back by the Earth Moon system? It comes back by us. We're we going to see pictures. What, what can we expect? So, well, the, the, the immediate next step after the launch, uh, which uh, which will happen, is we will check, of course, that all the instruments are operating nominally. Same for the spacecraft module, for all the, the spacecraft sub- submodules. And uh, next year, in, during the summer of 2024, we will have uh, the first Earth flyby. Uh, potentially linked, depending really on the launch date, but uh, we might have the first ever lunar Earth gravity assist, so double uh, use of the of both the Moon and the Earth. Uh, and during this, there will be operations taking place. Uh, and also, the focus shouldn't be really on science for those events, because this is really focusing on trying to get us there, because that's the main that's the main point. We will really try as much as possible to 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 get some. Uh, some interesting, at least, yes, uh, images or, or, or some of the of the data from the instrument already at that time. Then the, the in 2025 we will fly over Venus, which would be a great opportunity for science. But we have to be very cautious because basically this is a very very hot environment for Juice. Juice is has been has been built to be uh, in the Jovian system where the temperature is minus a few hundred uh, degrees. So uh, we need to take into account that uh, we need to protect the, all the instrumentation and all the payload during Venus. So in that case we will just try to orient the spacecraft, such as the high-gain antenna, which is the, the antenna we will use for the communication, will be pointing to the Earth, so the, uh, to the Sun, sorry, so, so it will protect the rest of the, of the, of the spacecraft. So that will be the, the, the second step. And then an, uh, two additional uh, Earth flyby in 2026 and 2029. And finally, in 2031, we'll get there and we will, we will enter in orbit around Jupiter. So that's, that's basically in a very... So we'll nutshell what's going on during the cruise phase. I know there's so much. Obviously, you and the entire ESA team have, have dedicated years uh, to programming a mission like this, to planning a mission like this. So I just want to thank you and your team. Congratulate you so far on this mission. We're really excited about it. And Claire, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Nah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Your space journey. Well, I really enjoyed my conversation with Claire today, and I'm so excited about the upcoming JUICE mission. It's going to be exciting. If you'd like to follow more and learn more, just go to ESA's website at ESA.int. I want to thank Claire for joining me today. I want to thank you for joining me as well. Again, if you could do me a small favor, share this episode with a friend. I'd certainly appreciate it. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time. God bless.